Thank you. Good morning. I, um, I don't think I've ever been described as very lovely before, so it's a very nice introduction. Um, I'll also apologise to all of you on this side of the room because I need to be close enough to the Mac to hit the button, so I'm not ignoring you. Well, I might be, but I'm not doing it intentionally. Uh, so to many, arts and sciences are considered to be the polar opposites of each other. But to me, really, there is an inherent beauty and an inherent art in science. We are now quite used to seeing beautiful images like this generated uh, from scientific experiments and procedures. And we see universities, newspapers, groups like the Wellcome Trust often running competitions to find the best images generated through science. More often than not, this type of image is as a result of our ability to look at things on a molecular level using new and ever-advancing technologies. We are really able to see the building blocks of life, and when they're blown up in high resolution like this, they are really quite beautiful. Many scientists who are most popular in the public's imagination have also found themselves the subject of popular arts, either the inspiration for or the subject of. For example, we have Warhol's images of Einstein. And here we have Lucy Glendinning's sculpture Discovery, which celebrates the life of Francis Crick. My favourite of all of these examples is actually in Moscow, in the metro. This is Mendeleevskaya metro. And we have Mendeleev, who was the father of the periodic table, celebrated in these huge stylized atoms that hang high above the heads of the commuting masses. But for some reason, when it comes to places of scientists' work, laboratories, research institutes, observatories, this idea of art and beauty seems to completely fall away and becomes completely subservient to this great architectural enemy that's function. For many years, laboratories have been fairly uninspiring campuses in out-of-town locations. <coughs> and in fairness, if you speak to a scientist, most of them will say, we don't really care what the building work looks like, we just want it to work. So to some extent, why would we do anything else? Um, but to be, to be honest, how much more inspiring would it be to be in the centre of a city, surrounded by life, in a beautifully designed building? There is a growing body of evidence, and it would seem perhaps self-evident to people like you and me, that a good, design, a good workplace design actually increases productivity and stimulates and motivates employees. Uh, presumably, stimulation and motivation are absolutely key to getting the best from scientific minds. For most of my engineering career, I've been in science-related projects for chemistry, plant sciences, neuroscience, um, for pharmaceutical companies, for higher education institutes, and in the UK and abroad. I'm really passionate about these projects for, for several reasons. Firstly, if you design this kind of building, you feel that you are doing something with a kind of higher purpose. I may never be a Nobel Prize winning scientist, but you feel that these buildings that you help design may in some way enable others to achieve greatness in their field and may do something of benefit to humanity. Secondly, laboratory buildings tend to be more challenging from an engineering point of view. They tend to have more challenges than you would find in, say, an office or a residential development. And thirdly, and this is really the crux of what I want to talk to you about today, these types of projects give you the opportunity to take everything that you know about the technical side of engineering and science and mix it with everything you know about the architectural side of engineering uh, and really marry the two. And to me, it shouldn't be one or the other. We should be able to combine the two. We have the experience and the knowledge to combine architecture and science and create something that is really quite beautiful. The history of laboratories isn't particularly well documented, which is something, as an audience, you should be quite grateful of because we could be here for a long time otherwise. Um, the first building to be really considered as a laboratory uh, is this one, and this is a 16th century observatory built for the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. And apologies to any Danish speakers. Um, as you can see, this is really a very remarkable building, but the, the structure, actually all of the structure, has a very strong purpose. The corners of the building were aligned very accurately in the north, south and east-west directions. And all the towers and the balconies served as instrument platforms and the overall alignment of the building was set very precisely to give the instruments maximum coverage of the sky and to simplify the alignment with the great mural quadrant. But this building uh, was rather unusual, and to be honest, we don't really see any more laboratories of, this, uh, of the type we would recognise uh, in the Western world until around the 19th century, which when laboratory design flourished with the founding of new universities. What is interesting is if we go even further back to Arabia, we find evidence of a much earlier scientific culture. Um, it is likely that much of the work of Tycho Brahe was inspired by this guy. There's a guy called Abu Awaf Barjani. I'm sure you will recognise. Um, he, was a, he was an astronomer in Persia, in Baghdad, and he, was, he died in around 998, some six centuries before Tycho Brahe. But clearly, because of the time and the history involved, there is very little evidence as to what these early Persian laboratories and observatories would look like. What we do know is that in 1259, the Maragray Observatory was founded in Iran, and this was considered one of the foremost institutions of its time. 
This in turn inspired the development of the 15th century Ulubeg uh, Observatory in Samarkand. And this is something we do know something about, as the building still exists, although be, albeit as a ruin. The observatory was founded in Samarkand in what is now Uzbekistan in around the 1420s. Unfortunately, following Beg's death, uh, the facility was more or less raised and the scientists fled. I should point out when I talk about death, it wasn't a very natural occurrence. He was actually assassinated by beheading through his eldest son. So whilst he might have been a brilliant scientist, he clearly had some father issues. <laughs> um, but what we do know about this building when it existed, was that it was a three-storey cylindrical building surrounding three enormous astronomical instruments. And this one that's left is the largest of them, and it's a great meridian arc. And light would fall through the, the building onto this arc, and the position of the sun on the arc would tell the scientists things about the length of the year, the time of the day, etc. <coughs> But I think in reality that we can't draw too many parallels between these two very early examples of laboratories and observatories with modern architecture. Although what I do find quite interesting is the idea that these buildings, the exterior form, which was quite beautiful, was very much influenced by the science that went on inside it. The exterior form supported the activities in the building. And this is really the complete opposite to what we see in, uh, in science architecture nowadays, whereas the architecture tends to be designed to conceal what goes on inside the buildings. It tends to try and hide away the science. And this is a, really a cultural change where we tend to mistrust the motives of others and where some forms of science are considered controversial. However, it would be interesting to think about whether the scientific community could engage more with the communities around them and whether that would then engender more trust between them because there's always more fear of the unknown than there is of the known. But you'll be glad to know that we're jumping forward to the 20th century. I'm not going to take you through all the intervening periods. But in the 20th century, we come across what is probably the finest example of laboratory design. And it's really a benchmark against which all uh, modern laboratories are compared. And it's the Salk Institute in La Jolla in California. It's a really inspirational site. It overlooks the, the, the Atlantic and is really quite an incredible setting. Uh, Jonas Salk was a pioneer of the polio vaccine. And his goal was to establish a research environment where biologists and others could collaborate and research the basic principles of life. He had a vision for this facility and he collaborated with architects and engineers to create a new paradigm for research and collaboration. <coughs> to this end, in 1959, he engaged Louis Kahn and he told him to create a facility worthy of Picasso, which he duly did. The site, which is a mesa or tableland just outside San Diego, was made possible through the involvement of the San Diego mayor, who is himself a survivor of polio. The facility opened in 1963 and is now as famous for its architecture as it is for its science, both of which are world class. What is really interesting, though, is what inspired Salk to create this unique building. In the 1950s, when Salk was working on a cure for polio, he was working in a basement laboratory in Pittsburgh. He found that inspiration was very slow in coming, so he took a break and he went to Italy and he visited a 13th century monastery in Assisi. While he was there, inspiration hit, and he came across the idea that would ultimately lead him to develop the successful vaccine. Salk became so convinced that it was his surroundings that had inspired him that he then wanted to go on and create an institute that allowed people the, the environment to, to create great science. And, but was he successful in this challenge? It's very difficult to tell, as there's, very little, there's no real empirical way of measuring success in science. Um, but at the risk of offending scientists in the room, an oft-quoted way of, of measuring success is by looking at how many Nobel laureates have come from facility. Uh, Salt currently has three Nobel laureates on its faculty. <coughs> it has three now deceased laureates. And a further five scientists who trained at the Salk have gone on to win Nobel Prizes at other facilities. Unfortunately, the opening of the um, Salk in 1963 did not then lead to a mass development of, of very inspiring laboratories. In fact, quite the opposite. And that's not to say that some didn't try, and it's not to say that there aren't some cautionary tales. I would, I would, want, I would warn that uh, just employing an architect on a science project does not give you a brilliant laboratory. This is quite an interesting tale, and this is from um, this is the University of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Uh, in the 1950s, they decided that they wanted to commission a new uh, medical research building and they actually engaged Louis Kahn. This is a few years before the Salk Institute. Uh, this building opened in, 19, in 1960 and is known as the Richards Medical Research Building. And whilst this building is lauded architecturally because of its use of reinforced concrete, it is widely considered to be a, a, 
I won't say the word failure, but it's widely considered to be not very successful as a laboratory building. So it's interesting we can have a facility that's lauded for its architecture, but actually the science, which is the main point of the building, is actually quite poor. It took a very long time for the scientists to adapt the building to their requirements. There were quite a number of problems with the, with the building. One was daylighting, in that they had far too much. There was no blinds or any shading on the building, and scientists found that the daylight was ruining experiments. They also had a lot of exposed services, which many of the scientists didn't like, and they went around and covered them up. And Kahn also promoted this idea of openness and collaborative working spaces, which very much went against the ethos of the scientists who preferred to work in secrecy and in small private cells. Although it's interesting that most modern laboratory design now actually encourages the, the opposite and is very much into the social engineering and interaction between scientists, really whether they like it or not. This design overall uh, really suffered from a lack of engagement with scientists and suffered from the fact that Kahn had never worked on a research building before. What I find quite remarkable, though, is that a mere three years later, he then opened the Salk Institute, which is really the pinnacle of laboratory design and has not really been uh, surpassed in 50 years. So there have been many years of uninspiring grey boxes. And you do wonder how much more could have been achieved if these buildings had been motivational and inspirational places. But I think we're really seeing a renaissance in laboratory architecture. We are seeing more and more laboratories moving into the centre of cities. And we are seeing signature architects lining up to work on them. If we consider just in recent years, we've had the Frick Chemistry Laboratory at Princeton with Hopkins Architects, and we've had the Sainsbury Laboratory at Cambridge with Stanton Williams Architects. We also have two major uh, London institutes currently under construction. Uh, in October 2012, uh, the Sainsbury Laboratory won the coveted Reba Sterling Prize. And this was the first time a building of this type had won the prize. In her summing up, the, um, the Reba judge, Joanna Van Hennigan, said that the importance of the project was the lifting of a building type that could have been utilitarian into a sublime piece of calm and peaceful architecture. The building was up against, amongst others, a theatre and a gallery, very much not utilitarian buildings and very much the stomping ground of architects. And to me, that's what makes these projects really special. It's something where you can take something that is entirely functional and turn it into something that is both functional and beautiful. And to me, it's really engineers who can help break down the barriers between the contrasting requirements of scientific function and architectural form. Uh, the engineer can really be the arbiter between the functional requirements of the scientists and the vision of the architect. We, as engineers, can decide what can be rethought, reworked, reimagined to work within the architectural fabric and what really is sacrosanct to the, to the scientific endeavour. The late American architect Don Prowler made this uh, following statement. He's, he observed that if labs embody, embody the spirit, culture and economy of our age, what cathedrals were to the 14th century and office buildings were to the 20th century, laboratory is to the 21st century. And to me this is a fascinating and very, very apt comment. With the re recent economic stagnation of the past few years, we have very much seen the commercial sector, the office buildings, shrink back, but we have seen a real growth in the science and industry sectors. The pharmaceutical industry is very important to the UK economy and is actually the third largest exporter after finance and business services. It currently has a net positive trade balance of £7 million. If we also look at research and development sector, which incorporates the non-pharmaceutical side of science research, we see that they, they employ 0.4% of the UK employment market compared to only 0.1% of the pharmaceutical industry. However, if we look at the relative outputs of both these industries, we see a very different story. Research and development accounts for 0.3% of output, whereas pharmaceutical accounts for a relatively large 0.7%. So we're expecting the pharmaceutical industry to grow um, as a result of, of the ageing population. So that is a sector we still see lots of potential in. But in addition the R&D sector, you can see we're employing a lot of people for relatively little output, so this would suggest there is a lot of potential in this, in this market to do with commercialisation of the research. And this is a trend that we've seen reflected in Arup in the past few years. Um, in the last financial year, we saw our own science and industry sector within Arup grow by 15%, and our minimum forecast growth for the next financial year is 10%, so it's really a very strong side of our business. And we have also seen this, this being reflected right here on our doorstep in Fitzrovia. As far as I mentioned at the beginning, we have the Sainsbury Welcome Centre across the road, which 
hopefully you noticed when you came in this morning. Uh, we also have the immense Crick Institute up at King's Cross, which is currently under construction and is due to be the largest research institute in Europe. There are also hospitals. Just in Huntley Street, we have the UCLH Macmillan Cancer Centre. And ever so slightly further afield, we have a new cancer centre in design for guys in St Thomas's. So all of these projects were started in the last four years and have really um, bucked the trend and defied the economic gloom. So as the, as the financial endeavour has grown of this, of this um, industry, we have also seen the scientific endeavour grow. We talk more and more about big science, and by big science we mean science basically on a very large scale. We're not talking so much about the individual in a laboratory, we're talking about a collection of individuals, a collection of institutes all working together. We have projects like the Large Hadron, Hadron Collider, and we have projects such as the Human Genome Project, which use institutes all over the world to crack this code. And as, this, as the idea of science changes, the idea of architecture and the engineering that supports it really needs to change. And so the title of this talk posed the question, do engineers really get it? And obviously I think, yes, we do. And I hope I've gone some way to proving this to you today. To me, these projects really present the greatest opportunity to engineers and to architects because they take the science side and they take the architecture side and you can marry the two. Here are buildings that almost have a duty to inspire and to motivate those within them. And so to me, there is art in science, and there is most undoubtedly should be art and beauty in the buildings that surround them. Thank you. I thought it was very informative, very uh, interesting, and uh, I particularly enjoyed the way that she'd married the science and art aspects in her talk, and um, beautifully presented too, yeah. Um, a field I'd like to get much more involved in as well, so I think it was an inspiring talk too. Well, I mean, it's very interesting to see how an engineer views architecture because it's, um, it's refreshing to actually see an engineer have a, have a view on it. And no, you seem shocked. <laughs> no, but it's it's um, and it's actually it's quite a little education for us, or so for me, in terms of understanding the um, number of buildings that I wasn't aware. Of. So it's a very interesting talk. I thought it was really good. I, I like all these talks, so um, yeah, that's why you see me. Um, I thought it was good. I would have liked to see more analysis of the buildings because I thought they were really interesting. The ones that she selected, they're kind of favourites of mine. It was quite different to what I expected. I thought it was about arts within buildings, but actually the, the talk was about the combination of art and science and architects working with engineers. I'm an architect, so it's always good to hear how we can work well together and, and basically produce a really good building. So. No, it's very, it's very interesting.